Greetings one and all, Oslo Montgomery. Back sooner than you expected. Well, maybe not that soon. Not like the good old days. New episode every week or two. Yeah, those days are gone. Or are they? Part two today, Kublai Khan. He was the founding emperor of the Yuan Dynasty. He was also the fifth Kagan, or Great Khan, of the Mongol Empire in a line stretching back to Grandfather Genghis Khan. Kublai was the second son of Tolui, and Tolui was Genghis Khan's youngest son. Last episode, we took a bird's-eye overview of the rise of the Mongols. Maybe it was more like a Felix Baumgartner's eye view, but I think you all got the general idea how the Mongols got this far. It was really at a loss about how far to wade into the deep end of the pool of Mongolian names and tribal relationships. This empire of four khanates that stretched from the Pacific Ocean to Eastern Europe had drifted apart to the extent that Kublai Khan, even though being the top guy, the great Khan of the so-called Mongol Empire, had no control or even influence over what happened in the other three khanates in Central Asia, the Middle East, Persia, or up in Russia where the Golden Horde was located. Every time the Khagan dies, there's a new one selected to rule them, but it was just done to keep up appearances and to give ancestor Genghis Khan some face. So we hurriedly left off in 1264 after Kublai Khan prevailed over his younger brother, Arik Boke, and his allies after the untimely death of their mutual brother, Monke Khan. But as I said, Arik Boke, even with the strong support he had from conservative Mongol nobles, did not emerge victorious against older brother Kublai, who had all the resources of China at his disposal not to mention a few halfway decent Chinese military and political advisors. Now, all this time, China has been enjoying this nice reprieve. The Zhao ruling family of the southern Song caught a break when Monke Khan died so abruptly like he did in 1259, right at the beginning of the Mongol invasion of Song, China. The Chinese got to breathe a sigh of relief as the Mongols abandoned their conquest and fought with each other over the succession. But Kublai Khan eventually got it all sorted out to the extent that by the 1270s, the southern Song dynasty's good fortune was about to come to an end. Now, if anyone in the Mongol world was best suited to conquer China, Kublai Khan would be that person. He began earning his China chops at the age of 17 when his father, Tolui, died in 1232. Mongol custom dictated that Kublai Khan's mother marry Tolui's older brother. This was Ogede Khan. But instead, she worked out a better deal whereby she would just live out her days as a widow at a fiefdom granted to her in Zhengding, just northeast of Shijiazhuang in Hebei. And it's here in Hebei province where the young Kublai Khan in the 1230s began his education in Chinese culture, customs, and administration. This fief given to Tolui's widow was known as an appanage. Basically, an appanage is a gift of land or title usually given to a prince by the king. This was used extensively in France and several other civilizations. It was certainly the system in place during the Mongol conquests. If someone did something that was worthy of the Khan's notice, he got a backhander in the form of an appanage. The Mongol nobleman, given the appanage, didn't end up living on that land. He would just milk the place for whatever he could get in taxes or whatever. And there were any number of Central Asians, mainly Muslim, that the Mongol noble could hire to manage the appanage on his behalf and terrorize the local Chinese peasants into handing over exorbitant amounts of taxes. It's said that when Kublai Khan was living in China, near Zhengding at Hebei, he really embraced the culture. Though he never learned to speak Chinese, he became close to and made good use of many capable Chinese advisors throughout his reign. Kublai Khan's success in becoming the next great Khan over his younger brother was due a lot in part from the advice he received at this crucial hour from many of his other Chinese and Uyghur advisors. He also adopted the Chinese custom of reign names, in 1260, after the rump curl tie, where he declared himself the new great Khan, he announced the beginning of the Zhongtong era. This 
kind of un mongol like behavior, announcing this era, and then, and then later moving the capital closer to China. It was a clear signal that this Mongol ruler was throwing his lot in with China. In 1264, when he moved into his new capital, he will declare another new era, the Zhiyuan period. This Zhiyuan era lasts till his death in 1294. All this exposure in China in his 20s gave Kublai Khan a distinct advantage over his detractors. Let's quickly look at what he did mid-1260s. Once he was all settled in and had all his brothers, nephews, cousins, and other detractors at bay. You know, with the fall of the Jin Dynasty in 1234, it meant that all these Chinese officials and capable administrators who kept the place going for their Jurchen overlords were basically out of a job. This held true for military men as well. As the Jin Dynasty was still hanging in there by a thread trying to survive the Mongol onslaught, many Chinese turned on them and assisted the conquering Mongols in delivering the coup de grace. Chief among uh, Kublai Khan's Chinese advisors were a Chan Buddhist monk named Hai Yun Chanshi and a defrocked monk he introduced named Liu Bingzhong. Hai Yun's fame as a wise man and spiritual master, had spread far and wide enough where he came up on the radar of Kublai Khan. Hai Yun was invited up to Karakoram, the magnificent capital built by Ogade Khan, where he met the fifth great Khan, Kublai. These are pre-Xanadu days. I guess the greatest thing Hai Yun did for Kublai Khan was to introduce him to Liu Bingzhong. Liu served the Khan for more than 30 years. He was the Khan's guy for architectural and urban planning, feng shui, religious and spiritual affairs. And once Liu Bingzhong ingratiated himself sufficiently enough with his benefactor, he became a conduit for many other talented and capable Han Chinese to make their way into the Mongol-dominated government. The way the Mongols did it, all the top spots and most critical executive decision-making positions in government were staffed by themselves. Everything else, like 90% of the government and administration, and military as well, was staffed with Chinese, Kitans, Jurchens, Uyghurs, and all the other conquered peoples in the empire. In the Mongol system, they occupied the top rung of the ladder and enjoyed the greatest benefits, leniency in the laws, and a whole slew of other privileges. One rung below the Mongols were the other peoples of the Asian part of the steppe, they weren't good enough to be called Mongols, but they thanked their lucky stars. They weren't Chinese. That was the third rung of the ladder. Not just any Chinese, the northern Chinese, the ones the Mongols were most familiar with. The lowest of the lows were the southern Chinese. They had defied the Mongols the longest and were therefore particularly reviled. And they had it the worst. Realizing his future was tied with China, Kublai Khan decided to move closer to where all the action was. In 1263, he called for a new capital to be constructed at Kaiping, 200 miles north of Beijing. This was where the old Jin central capital was, in the state of Yen. This city is later called Shangdu. Liu Bingzhong was the one who led the planning and construction of Kublai Khan's palace at Shangdu, a.k.a. Xanadu of Samuel Taylor Coleridge fame. So that pleasure dome at Xanadu was the work of this Chinese man of many talents who was an integral part of Kublai Khan's inner circle. Shangdu later became Kublai Khan's summer palace, where he spent about half the year. It's been said this city, when it was completed in 1276, was the biggest in the world with over half a million inhabitants. The Shangdu city walls were even bigger than the walls constructed in Beijing during the Ming and Qing. There's hardly anything that remains of Shangdu. It's located in Inner Mongolia, a four- or five-hour drive north from Chengde in Hebei. By the way, around that time, 1264, the father and uncle of Marco Polo were well into their first trip to Cathay. Thanks to Hulagu Khan, they had worked their way into this embassy that was traveling east to meet with Kublai Khan. And in 1266, indeed, Niccolo and Maffeo Polo met the great Khan, and some of you may remember it was during this famous meeting in 1266 where Kublai Khan wrote a letter to the Pope in Rome that was hand-carried back to Italia by the two brothers Polo. But thanks to instability in the papacy with too many popes dying one after another, nothing 
ever came of Kublai Khan's wishes for the Pope to send a hundred men back to his lands to teach Christianity. In 1272, as he readied himself to move into this brand new mega palace, he not only declared that the Mongol capital had been moved, he also announced that heaven's mandate had officially been passed to him and that a new dynasty had been proclaimed. Another thing that's attributed to Liu Bingzhong was the naming of the Yuan dynasty. He had been the one to suggest to his Khan that the dynasty be named the Yuan. Actually, it was called the Da Yuan, or Great Yuan. They were the first to do that, stick that Da in there, meaning great. The Qing dynasty would also do this. Also, this character Yuan, it represented the first time that a founding dynasty didn't reach back to ancient times to select a name from the formidable pool of former Zhou-era states. So after Kublai Khan declared the mandate of heaven had been passed to him, the Yuan dynasty was formally established on Chinese New Year Day, January 18th, 1272. And as an encore to Shangdu, Liu Bingzhong was also made the general contractor for Dadu, the city we all know today as Beijing. It was also known as Kanbalik, the city of the Khan. Marco Polo referred to it as Kambula. This magnificent palace will stand for three quarters of a century before the Ming Dynasty founder Zhu Yuanzhang's army does to that structure in 1369 what the Mongols had done to the Jin palaces when the Jurchens met their Waterloo. Kanbalik, when it was finished, replaced Karakoram as the new seat of the Mongol Empire, divided as it was. Karakoram, again, built by Ogde Khan following the death punch of the Jurchen Jin in 1234. If you look on Google Earth for the town of Karakoram, modern-day Karakoram, you'd see it's almost right smack dab in the center of Mongolia. It's about as remote as you can get and one hell of a long drive to the beach. Just recently, uh, this is now June uh, 2016 when I'm recording this, some maintenance workers were laying some electrical cable underneath the western wing of the Forbidden City in Beijing. Lo and behold, deep below the palace, they chanced upon some broken tiles and porcelain. And archaeologists analyzed the relics and found proof using whatever means these amazing scientists used to date them to no later than the start of the Ming in 1368. This means it was made in the Yuan. So these relics were found buried underneath the foundation for the palace built in the Ming and then rebuilt in the Qing. So what does all this mean? Up till now, no one was certain where the Yuan palace was in Datu. They only knew with certainty that it was somewhere in present-day Beijing. But all these years, they had never been able to pinpoint its exact location. Now they did. Kublai Khan's palace in Kanbalik, or Datu, designed by Liu Bingzhong, was located right underneath the one you see today, with Chairman Mao's picture at the front gate. I also read there won't be any heavy excavation work carried out in fear of, well, damaging everything that's above the find. Isn't that funny how this great discovery was made right when I was doing this episode? One small thing, uh, the Mongols ruled with a very unpleasant iron fist, but they didn't make the Chinese adopt their customs. The Manchus did that. When they blew the Ming away in 1644, they made their Chinese subjects adopt many of their customs, you know, like all Han males having to shave their head and wear a queue. It wasn't such a big deal to Kublai Khan that his Chinese subjects adopt Mongol ways. Liu Bingzhong and all the Chinese men of talent he had brought to the court of Kublai Khan had had their way ever since about the 1240s. This was one of the main criticisms that Kublai Khan had to put up with. His fellow Mongols were constantly bitching. He was too tolerant of them and gave them too dominant a role in the Yuan government. But in 1262, a Chinese governor up in Shandong, Li Tan, very much trusted by the Mongols, rose up in defiance of Kublai Khan. This uprising was eventually put down by Kublai Khan's loyal Han Chinese general, Shi Tianzi. I mentioned him last episode. He was the most renowned of Kublai Khan's Chinese military men. I guess uh, Shi Tianzi and Liu Bingzhong were the two best-known Chinese during the Yuan. Anyway, as long as the southern Song was still alive... Kublai Khan remained uneasy on his throne. 
And after this Litan rebellion, all the Mongol factions who despised the Chinese pointed at that bloody uprising and told Kublai Khan he was naive and had better take measures to counterbalance the influence of these Chinese and the Yuan government. And this is exactly what happened. And from that point forward until the fall of the Yuan, following the Litan uprising, the Chinese had to put up with more Mongol and Central Asian influence in the government. The Chinese themselves were already riddled with factions and attacking each other. Now matters were further complicated by being forced to work more closely with the Uyghurs and other Central Asians who served as proxies for the Mongols and the government administration. All these Chinese who had made their way to Shangdu and Datu, although they all didn't see eye to eye on their politics, they were all in lockstep with regard to the urgency, at all costs, of preserving Chinese culture. Many things were, of course, going to change. That was unavoidable and a price that had to be paid for conquest. But as far as the core traditions, going back to the Duke of Zhou and everything that had evolved since then, all Chinese in the employ of the Mongols worked to keep that flame going as best they could. So anyways, let's get back to the main event. Uh, Kublai Khan was no fool. Although he had all these loyal Chinese officials and military men working for him, he knew their heart and core loyalties were probably still with the southern Song. If push ever came to shove and it was Mongol against Song China, he wasn't quite sure where his loyal Chinese generals and officials would stand on the matter. Marco Polo had later written, quote, All Cathayans detested the rule of the great Khan because he set over them Tartars, or more frequently Saracens, whom they could not endure, for they treated them all like slaves, end quote. So, Song Dynasty, still living. But they were in a real bad way. Here's one of the important things to know about the Song Dynasty on the eve of the Mongol takeover. China, I think in its history, had never been richer or more economically vibrant than it was during the Song Dynasty. Even on the eve of the Mongol invasion, although the Grand Canal was all clogged in places and unusable, it had already done a swell job of busting open the interior and creating thriving markets all along the Yangtze and every tributary great and small that flowed into it. Hangzhou was at this time in the 13th century the richest and most fabulous city in the world. As far as problems the Song emperors had, money was not one of them. And a strong military was also not the emperor's headache. As we'll see, when the battle lines were drawn, the Chinese armies did not cut and run. It was no easy advance for the Mongols. It had taken three generations for the Mongols to finally conquer China. No other nations who fell to the Mongols ever lasted that long. Well, who knows if a Taizong or a Han Wu Di or a Liu Bei could have saved Song China from Kublai Khan's onslaught. Needless to say, no one even vaguely resembling those heroes from Chinese history sat on the throne up in present-day Hangzhou. The last five emperors kept getting younger and younger to the point where the last one was seven years old. He was the one who jumped off the cliff on Lantau Island off Hong Kong to evade capture by the Mongols. March 19th, 1279. And when that poor kid drowned, that spelled the formal end of the Song Dynasty. As far as the southern Song went, the last real emperor, the 15th since Zhao Kuangyin, reigned for a very long time, four decades. But this Li Zong emperor... He was right up there with Emperor Yang of Sui as far as his alleged addiction to the menu of services provided by his stable of concubines. He was a famous absentee emperor who let his ministers run things. The Li Zong emperor is usually hung out as the main reason for the reversal of fortune for the southern Song. When he died, the Empress Dowager Xie took charge. She will get to preside over the final demise of the dynasty. Li Zong was followed by the Du Zong Emperor, 1264 to 1274. He was another one of those leave-everything-to-his-ministers kind of guys. He shared the same chancellor as Li Zong, someone who ended up getting skewered in the official histories. Ming historians had a gas heaping lots of blame on Jia Sidao when they wrote the official history of the Yuan. 
the Li Zong Emperor and Jia Si Dao. Those two are usually pointed at the most as the primary scapegoats for the Song's problems. It's hard to know what the truth is. But this minister, Jia Si Dao, has been marked by posterity as truly one of the more noteworthy, self-serving, scheming ministers. Later generations would often use Jia Si Dao as their example for a treacherous official. Now, it was during this time of the Du Zong Emperor that the Polos began making their way east to China on their second trip. This was the trip where they went to uh, the trouble to bring actual signed documents from the Pope and authentic holy oil from Jerusalem. And this is the journey where Marco Polo accompanied his father and uncle. They won't get there until 1275. Also during the time of Du Zong, uh, Kublai Khan launched what he hoped would be a campaign to finish off the Southern Song. Now, he doesn't personally lead any troops into battle like the good old days, but he has a couple of guys who do a bang-up job. One was Aju, the 31-year-old grandson of Subate. Aju's father had been Kublai Khan's general who led the armies that brought down the Dali kingdom in Yunnan. His other general was a pretty important guy, Ba Yan of Barin. If you read Marco Polo's travels, he was the one referred to as Ba Yan Hundred Eyes. He came from a long line of generals going back to the conquests of Genghis Khan. His father was part of the squad that wiped out the assassins, the Hashashin, who we discussed last episode. However, he died in the attempt. After the conquest of the Song, Ba Yan of Barin would become the most important Yuan general for Kublai Khan with Aju in second place. Despite the well-known fact that Mongols were in particularly known as sailors, the plans to invade Song, China, relied heavily on a naval expedition. This plan called for a massive flotilla of ships to be sailed down the Han River, the Han Jiang, or Han Shui as it's known. This is one of the mighty rivers of China, 952 miles long. Its source is in the north of China near the Gansu Shanxi border, and it empties itself out, as any self respecting Hu Ren will tell you, in the city of Wuhan, right on the Yangtze River. This is the river that divides that great and historic city into three parts Wuchang, Hanko, and Hanyang. So the Mongol plan to finish off China involves sailing down this Han River to the Yangtze, and from there, if you just hung a left, China's longest river was right there, like an express lane that took you to Nanjing, then called Jiankang, and ultimately to Hangzhou, the Song capital. The Hangzhou itself wasn't on the Yangtze, but the Qiantang River was, and that led you right to downtown Hangzhou. But in order to reach the Yangtze via the Hanshui, the Mongols had to pass the twin cities of Xiangyang and Fancheng. These two cities were combined into one and are better known as Xiangfan. This is in northernmost Hubei. In December 2010, they were separated again. Now, this ancient city of Xiangyang served as the gateway to the China heartland, where the southern Song capital was located. Knowing this, the Song military kept this place heavily fortified in order to avoid just the kind of thing the Mongols were now planning. As I said, the Mongols weren't known for their naval prowess. So to handle all the logistics, they had mostly Chinese and Korean soldiers on board to supplement the Mongol cavalry, also laden on board these vessels. From 1267 to 1273, these two sides slogged it out. There was this new invention that was put into use for this battle of Xiangyang. We know it as a trebuchet. It's also called a trebuchet. The Chinese called it a hui hui pao, or Muslim trebuchet. It was a kind of catapult that employed counterweights that gave these siege weapons more heft and greater accuracy. You can't believe the damage a 300-pound object hurled at you from a great distance can do. It certainly helped the Mongols win this battle. Gunpowder had been around for a few centuries by then, and its explosive properties were used well in this battle and siege of Xiangyang. The gunpowder bombs were also hurled into the city by these hui hui pao, which were crude compared to what came later. But then again, so was the atom bomb used in World War II compared to the ones they got today. Uh, February 1273, the city fell, and it was left up to all these Chinese forts along the Hanshui to try and slow down the advance. 
But it, it was no use. That flotilla just kept on coming, advancing to the southeast in the direction of the Yangtze River. Just imagine, 850 years ago, invading Mongols, sailing down the Hanshui. <laughs> what a sight that must have been. Well, it took time, but they made it to Wuhan all right. Once there, in early 1275, they made that left turn and began heading east in the direction of Hangzhou. It was at this point where Empress Dowager Xie shamed Jia Sidao, the minister with all the bad advice, into leading forces personally to go deal with this unstoppable threat. So, March 1275, Jia Sidao led his 130,000 Chinese troops into a do-or-die battle to stop Bayan, who was leading this Mongol advance. Despite using 2,500 vessels to blockade the Yangtze, the Chinese forces under Jia Sidao's command were routed. And for failing the dynasty in this last-ditch effort, Empress Dowager Xie had Jia Sidao banished to Fujian. But like Hui Zong's minister, remember him, Tsai Jing? He also got himself banished when the northern Song was dying. Well, Jia Sidao got murdered along the way. So far had he fallen in disrepute because of all the problems now facing the soon-to-be-extinct southern Song dynasty. Following Jia Sidao's defeat, it was over for the southern Song. One by one, military leaders began defecting to the Mongols. There was a new emperor sitting on the throne now, all of four years old, so there wasn't much this Emperor Gong was able to do to ameliorate the Song Dynasty's desperate situation. The inhabitants of the city of Changzhou learned the hard way what happened when you didn't submit to the Mongols and put up a fight instead. Bayan's troops had a hard time getting this ancient city on the Grand Canal to submit to his armies. But when he finally did, to teach everyone a lesson, he had every inhabitant of Changzhou, who couldn't find a halfway decent hiding place, massacred down to the last man, woman, and child. Empress Dowager Xie, at the same time she was pushing Jia Sidao into battle, was also sending out feelers to the Mongols to see if a deal could be struck. By early 1276, Bayan's army were cooling their heels outside the gates of Lin'an, the Song capital, present-day Hangzhou, taking stock of the situation and realizing the futility of continuing, not to mention the potential, sacking of the most magnificent city in the world at the time and all that it meant to Chinese culture. Grand Empress Dowager Xie took the emperor, now five years old but still too young to save the day, and knocked on the door of the Mongol camp and surrendered. So Hangzhou fell without a fight. On February 10th, 1276, Bayan and his troops entered the city. Eleven days later, Emperor Gong, 16th in a line stretching back 300 years, bowed before Bayan. These Song royals fared better under the Mongols than Hui Zong and the northern Song royal court fared under the Jurchens. The Zhao royal family were all shipped north to Dadu and most were treated okay. But things weren't over yet. If you check the history books, they'll all say the Song dynasty lasted from 960 to 1279. So this being 1276 and all, there were three more years to go. Not everyone surrendered. Loyalists grabbed the younger brother of Emperor Gong and vowed to keep the dynasty going. The first stop for the six-year-old Duanzong Emperor was in Fujian, where a temporary capital was set up. When things got too hot in 1278, the Duanzong Emperor and his minders fled the scene, boarded a ship, and sailed to Hong Kong. First time a Chinese emperor took to the open seas on a ship. He died along the way, but thankfully the Song loyalists, led by loyal statesman and military man Lu Xiu Fu, had a backup emperor in the form of one Zhao Bing. Zhao Bing was crowned the Huaizong Emperor, and it's this young kid who had the dubious honor of being the last of the Zhaos. Even though it had been over for years, when Lu Xiu Fu dove off the cliff on Lantau Island with the boy emperor in his arms and crashed into the sea below, the southern Song was now considered officially over. Kublai Khan gained no small amount of prestige from all this. He had alienated himself from the other Mongol Khan's nobles who were revolted at his embrace of Chinese ways. But when he conquered the nation and took control of all the wealth of China... 
<laughs> he sure showed them. So, China was finished, at least for a while. Nothing lasts forever. But as far as Kublai Khan was concerned, he needed more worlds to conquer. But starting right about here, the luck of Hu Bilie, as he was called in Chinese, started to change. Even before China was all under his control, Kublai Khan had been jonesing to include Japan in his roster of conquered lands. After he had successfully made Korea a vassal state, he had been sending out feelers, and with every diplomatic overture he made to the Japanese, he was rebuffed and insulted. In fact, so insulting were the diplomatic responses from Japanese officials to the great Khan. By 1274, he decided to teach these upstart Japanese a lesson. He had a fleet of about 800 or so ships, large and small. They set sail for Japan. In November 1274, they made it to the island of Kyushu. This is the southernmost of uh, the islands making up Japan and the one closest to China. The force of 10,000 Mongols, plus Koreans and Chinese, of course, were met with Heavy resistance, but the Mongol army won the initial battles on Tsushima, Iki, and Hirato Islands. And they made landfall on Kyushu, though the Japanese, with home field advantage, put up a violent resistance. When suddenly a storm started rolling in, the Koreans had suggested they all make their way back to the boats and sail them away from the rocks so they wouldn't get all smashed up, leaving them stranded in enemy territory. This they did, and once everything was backed away from the rocky seashore, the whole fleet got swallowed up in the storm, and that was the end of that. Any soldiers who didn't make it back to the ship were brutally put to the sword by the Japanese. This didn't deter Kublai Khan, however, and he kept sending these diplomatic overtures and sending envoys, and these diplomats were just killed one after the other, had their heads cut off for crying out loud. Finally, Kublai Khan says, screw this, and in 1281, he calls for an even bigger punitive expedition to Japan. This time, he gets the help of the king of Korea, who sends not only 900 ships, but one of his best admirals, too. This was above and beyond the 140,000-man army assembled for the task. These were made up mostly of Chinese, Jurchens, and Kitans. The ships sailed from both Korea and Fujian with the plan to rendezvous in Kyushu by June of 1281. The Japanese knew what was coming, and this time they had taken precautions. By the time the Mongol fleet arrived in May 1281, the Japanese defenders were better prepared. Not much went well for the Mongols, and between May and July 1281, the Mongols were done in. By mid-August, whatever was left of the Mongol fleet and the remaining soldiers was destroyed in a two-day, full-blown typhoon. After the destruction wrought by these kamikaze, or divine winds, that spelled the end of Kublai Khan's high hopes regarding uh, the land of the rising sun. While the Mongols were getting their butts kicked in Japan, Kublai Khan had launched a successful campaign at cleaning up the Grand Canal. This marvel of human engineering really took a big hit in 1128 during the wars between the southern Song and the Jurchen Jin forces. Not only was the canal repaired, it was extended so that it reached the capital, Datu, present-day Beijing. So Hangzhou and Beijing were linked by this waterway for the first time. Well, Kublai Khan not only had to eat humble pie with Japan... He didn't have much luck either with military adventures in Burma and Vietnam during the 1280s. From their base in Yunnan, the Mongols pushed south, but as I said, not much luck. In 1292-1293, same thing happened with a Mongol attempt at taking the Indonesian island of Java. Another debacle. These were Kublai Khan's last years. He had grown mortally obese and was said to be suffering from severe depression over the loss in 1281 of his principal wife, Empress Chabi. She was not only his favorite wife, she was one of his most trusted advisors. Then, to make matters even worse, his second son and crown prince, Zhen Jin, died in 1286 at the age of 43. This prince, also called Prince Jingim, some of you may remember from the Netflix production on the life of uh, Marco Polo. Uh, Zhen Jin's son, Temur, 
was made the new crown prince, and he will become the next Khan and emperor following the death of Kublai Khan. Marco Polo had already left China a few years before the death of Kublai Khan on February 18, 1294. So, Kublai Khan, he had a very sad ending, but lived a nice, long life, living till the age of 78. Things will begin to unravel quickly for the Mongols in China once Kublai Khan is gone. He was given the posthumous temple name of Shirzu. Nine more emperors will follow him to round out the remaining 74 years of the Yuan Dynasty. Kublai Khan's three lines of sons and their proxies were always battling it out for the top spot. And one thing about these remaining Yuan Dynasty emperors, they preferred to leave important matters in the hands of their ministers and advisors. No one even came close to being a Kublai. Temur Khan took over from his grandfather and reigned as the Chengzong Emperor. He lasted from 1294 to 1307. In addition to his title of Yuan Dynasty Emperor, he was also the sixth of the great Khans. They still kept that facade going. One of the characteristics of his reign was that this son tried to patch things up with the other Khanates. Kublai Khan had been at odds with them for going on 30 years. The war in particular with Kaidu had caused a great financial strain on the Yuan resources. This Kaidu Kublai War of 1268 to 1301 pitted this descendant of Ogade Khan against Kublai and his allies. All of these expensive military adventures or misadventures, the Chengzong Emperor called them all off. They had been costly failures. Other than that, however, he pretty much continued the policies of Kublai Khan. By now, with Kublai's passing and the Kaidu Kublai Wars at an end, the four Khanates were split even further apart. When Chengzong died in January 1306, there was no ear to replace him, so you know what that meant. Kulag Khan was up next. He was the Wuzong Emperor. He was 26 when he became the third Yuan Emperor and died at the age of 29, so he didn't last long. He was a young warrior and fought well in the Kaidu Wars. So when Temur Khan, the Chengzong Emperor, died, Kulag Khan was looked at by the elders as the most suitable candidate to become the new emperor. Factionalism was rife during this emperor's reign, although this becomes the norm for the rest of the dynasty. The conservatives amongst the Mongol nobility had high hopes in this Wuzong emperor. On paper, he was their kind of guy. They were really itching to turn the clock back and make things less Chinese and more Mongol. In the end, this emperor turned out to be more interested at having a good time and being emperor rather than actually acting like an emperor. When it came time to act like a ruler, he had people handle all that stuff for him. But Yantu Khan followed. He was the great-grandson of Kublai Khan and was known as the Renzong Emperor. His reign was considered a good time for Chinese culture. It certainly was a good time for Confucianism. The government began to take on a more Confucian smell. Chief among the new changes was the return of the civil service exams. From 1279 to 1315, they had been abolished. And the civil service exams were all based on Neo-Confucianism. I will introduce that when we get into the history of Chinese philosophy. This began with Zhu Xi. He lived from 1130 to 1200. He was born a few years after the fall of the Northern Song, which meant his life was contemporary with Chinggis Khan, though Zhu Xi was older than the great Khan by 32 years. I won't discuss his philosophy here. Let's just say after Confucius, Zhu Xi is arguably the most important Chinese philosopher. He took four of the most important works of the Eastern Zhou, the Analects, the Mengzi, the Great Learning, and the Doctrine of the Mean, and grouped these works together, calling them the Si Shu, the four books, the Lun Yu, Mengzi, Da Xue, and Zhong Yong. They weren't called the four books until Zhu Xi grouped them together and started calling them that. Prior to this, the Yi Jing played a more important role in Chinese thought and how things were explained. Zhu Xi's commentaries on these four books formed the basis of the imperial civil service exams pretty much from that point in the Yuan in 1315 all the way to September 2nd, 1909, with only minutes to go in the Qing dynasty. 
there's way more to this, and we're not even going to wander any further down this path. We'll come back another day to examine Zhu Xi and his contributions to Chinese philosophy. So this emperor reigned during a good period for Chinese culture. Certainly was the best time ever for Confucianists during the Yuan. Many kinds of old Mongol institutions were done away with. Renzong had a coterie of Chinese advisors and was quite the Sinophile himself. But when he died in 1320, that spelled the end of his policies. The Yingzong emperor who followed in 1320 witnessed yet another bloody political phase. He was the son of Renzong. In fact, you could call it the beginning of the end for the Yuan dynasty with this emperor. There's now a grand counselor who is controlling everything. This is Temudu. He also served the previous emperor. Uh, Ying Zong's father. This guy was the bete noir of the Confucian faction who had the support of the emperor. And those two sides, the Confucianists and the Mongol interests, led by Temudar, locked horns. Fortunately, and who the heck knows what really happened, Temudar died in 1322. Needless to say, the Confucian faction at the Ying Zong emperor's court had to have been feeling good without that guy to deal with anymore. Yeah, these Chinese at court didn't have to deal with Temudar anymore, but they did have to deal with his surviving supporters and hangers-on whose livelihood depended on their benefactor's good health and continued good position at court. So they assassinated Ying Zong in 1323. Poor guy was only 20 years old. The conspirators thought, with this new Tai Ding emperor on the throne, he'd make a great puppet. On paper, he came squarely from the conservatives' camp. The only problem was that he simply changed his mind and became a stalwart supporter of the Chinese Confucian faction instead, under suspicion himself for complicity in the assassination of the previous emperor. He went out of his way to show everyone it wasn't him. All the suspects involved in the assassination were either executed or banished, and the Tai Ding emperor became a, a cheerleader for adherence to Confucianist principles. The Tai Ding Emperor's grandfather was Zhen Jin, son of Kublai Khan, who died before succeeding his father to the Khanship. It's thought among Yuan scholars that this Tai Ding Emperor, in fact, did have a hand in the assassination of the Yingzong Emperor. Of course, not surprising considering the times. Like all his predecessors, he had his own ministers and basically left everything in their hands. When he died in August 1328 in Shangdu, even more instability than usual followed. You could see by now the mandate of heaven was clearly slipping through the hands of these unworthy descendants of Genghis Khan. One other thing, uh, during the period of this Khan's short reign, this Tai Ding emperor, uh, it's thought that Oderic of Pordenone made it to China during this time. From 1296 to 1329, this adventurous Franciscan monk took a trip out east, just like the Polos did. He made it to Guangdong, Fujian, Zhejiang, and Jiangsu. He saw Hangzhou and said the same things everyone else did about how amazing it was. And the capstone of the trip was that he got to meet with the great Khan, who was probably this one, Yesun Temur, Emperor Tai Ding of Yuan. You see, now, 14th century, people aren't so scared about traveling these great distances anymore. The age of discovery is only a century away as this Yuan dynasty starts winding down. Instead of visits from adjacent lands, people will be coming more regularly to China from faraway lands. Okay, I'm going to finish off the Yuan emperor by emperor, but there's all kinds of ambient music going on in the background. There are epidemics and famines all over the place. You know, once you left the gravity of a city or major town, if you lived out in the countryside especially the hard-to-get parts of the countryside. What went on in the capital and all the political upheaval didn't impact you too much. If you were one of these people, the weather from day to day was a million times more important than whatever mischief was being perpetrated in the halls of power. So when a famine hit or the Yellow River overflowed or some sickness would descend on a village, forget about the state. It was every man for himself. So right after this Tai Ding Emperor, early 1330s, a particularly bad epidemic hit. No one had ever seen anything like this one before. It was terrible. It seemed to mainly affect only the northern part of China. I've read that as many as 90% of the population died. 
And with all the Mongol soldiers and merchants constantly traveling west to the other khanates of the empire, whatever the hell it was that was decimating the population of North China, they brought it with them. That's how the Black Death started. 1346 to 1353, the worst pandemic in recorded history. 30 to 60 percent of the population of Europe died. Worldwide, about 100 million people perished. That all started happening during these declining years of the Yuan. The Taiting Emperor died in 1328, and his seven-year-old son got to be emperor for a month before he, too, was overthrown in a coup. This period in Yuan Dynasty history is known as the War of the Two Capitals, the Liangdu Zhejiang. Two capitals. Hmm, must be a civil war. There were two main factions fighting for power. One was based in Shangdu, the summer capital, and one was in Dadu, or Kanbalik, present-day Beijing. The faction in Dadu emerged victorious in this power struggle. And that's all it was, just various branches of the family all killing each other to claim the top spot. This went on until 1332. It was very destructive. During this period of the two capitals, there were three emperors. The last one, who got to boast about being emperor, reigned for less than two months and died young at the age of six. While all of this killing and political backstabbing was going on, the rest of the country was falling to you-know-what. When the last Yuan Dynasty emperor, all of 13 years old, began his reign in 1333, Zhu Yuanzhang will be celebrating his fifth birthday. Of course, when young Zhu Yuanzhang hits his 40th birthday, he'll be burning down Kanbalik and chasing these Mongols back to Mongolia. Then he'll found the Ming Dynasty. This last Yuan Dynasty emperor... Togun Temur, Emperor Shun, not the Shun from 2200 BC, who named you the Great as his heir. This was a different character, but same fourth tone, Shun. He was the Mongol emperor on duty when the party ended for the Yuan dynasty. From the chaos and destruction in the countryside emerged the White Lotus Society. These were anti Yuan elements who all came together to fight or lend influence in opposing this Mongol oppression that usually came in the form of you know, these terrible taxes. They were responsible for playing a behind-the-scenes role in the launching of the Red Turban Rebellion in 1352. What the Yellow Turbans did to the Han early in the 3rd century, the Red Turbans will do to the Yuan. It will hasten their demise. Once you lose that mandate of heaven, there's no getting it back. Ever since Kublai Khan died in 1294, it had been mostly downhill for the Yuan dynasty he founded. By the 1320s and certainly by the 1340s, it was clear these guys were on their way out. Zhu Yuanzhang didn't lead the Red Turban Rebellion at first, but he was definitely a major guy in the rebel forces. After knocking out a few of his rivals in the Red Turban leadership, Zhu Yuanzhang established himself as the top rebel leader fighting to overthrow the Yuan and adopting a platform of dump the Yuan and restore the Han didn't have trouble finding popular support. To secure the leadership of the movement and therefore the leadership in overthrowing the Yuan, Zhu Yuanzhang starred in a major epic battle that happened on Lake Poyang for about two months, end August to beginning of October in the year 1363. You had the Poyang Hu Zhejian, the Battle of Poyang Lake. I won't get into the details here because that one is worth its own podcast. Three rebel groups contending for supremacy in the movement all met at Lake Poyang. It was one heck of a naval battle involving these tower ships, fire ships, explosive gunpowder bombs, and all the latest mid-14th century military technology. There were three contenders flying the flags of Han, Chu and Ming, right there on Lake Poyang in Jiangxi province. The Ming forces under Zhu Yuanzhang prevailed and came out as the unchallenged leaders of this Red Turban Rebellion. And then five years later, he was calling himself the Hongwu Emperor. He was the only dynasty founder, Zhu Yuanzhang was, other than Liu Bang of the Han Dynasty, to come from a humble, non-aristocratic background. By 1368, he burned Kanbalik to the ground, and all the Mongols got chased back up to their traditional homelands in Mongolia. Shangdu as well, in 1369, was taken by the Ming forces. 
The Shun Emperor continued to reign for two more years up in a part of what's today Inner Mongolia. He died a couple years later in 1370. Yuan loyalists kept the Yuan dynasty going till 1635 in the the form of the Northern Yuan dynasty. But as far as the Mongols' time on the stage in Chinese history as the main act, their 15 minutes were up. I suppose for all these years, going back to the moment they first came on the scene, the Han Chinese were never fond of these Mongol invaders. Same thing in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. Their ways, culture, the attitude with which they treated the people they subdued, nobody liked them. They were rough and not anyone you wanted to pick a fight with. They sure were fantastic, however, at getting talented people to work for them. So, 1350s, 1360s, I guess you could call these the payback years for the Han Chinese. There was some real brutal fighting going on between the Han Chinese during the Red Turban Rebellion and the Mongol soldiers. A lot of retribution was meted out against these Mongols who got caught up in some kind of moment. If somebody from the future would have told Kublai Khan in 1279 that it would all come down to this, he never would have believed it in a million years. All the great world powers since have learned that lesson. Nothing lasts forever. And no matter how great and powerful you are, there's always going to come a time when people won't fear you. But the Yuan Dynasty left behind one incredibly rich legacy. The Han Chinese didn't go to sleep for half a century during this occupation. Quite a lot of nice stuff came out of this period. Just the other day, I had the pleasure to be kicking back with this restaurateur from Shandong who was in town and prepared for me this 30-year-old Pu'er tea that he very expertly served for me, and these teacups that he said came from the Yuan dynasty. This guy was quite loaded, so I had no reason to doubt it. And he went on and on about all the achievements in Yuan dynasty ceramics. He taught me about the kilns of Longquan uh, near Lishui in Zhejiang province, and Jingdezhen too. This place, so famous the world over as the capital of China's porcelain industry, became world-renowned during the Ming for its blue and white porcelain. Zheng He spread that stuff around wherever he went on those seven voyages. It all began in the Yuan, not the Ming. It's well known that the achievements made in the Song Dynasty in painting, calligraphy, poetry, philosophy, and the sciences were great indeed. Well, things kept going, albeit quietly, during the Yuan. There are so many names, uh, Liu Yin, Wu Cheng, Guo Shou Jing, Zhao Mingfu, and his talented wife, Guan Dao Sheng, and painter Liu Guan Dao, who painted one of the definitive works portraying Kublai Khan during a hunting party. You know, the museums of the world where Chinese art can be found are filled with treasures from this period. A lot of literature made it down to our time, written by more than 200 Yuan literati and scholar officials. This includes more than 100 Yuan dramas. All these documents, works of art, plays, and whatnot, give a very blurry but discernible snapshot of what the times were like. Seven, eight hundred years ago was a long time, but it wasn't so long ago that hardly anything has made it to our 21st century. The Yuan Dynasty years weren't all bad, and neither were the times. We must credit the Yuan Dynasty for unifying China into one big nation. North and South had been separate for something like 400 years. They divided China up into provinces, or Sheng. Uh, the Chinese map during the Yuan was divided up into the capital city of Dadu, plus 10 surrounding provinces. And this grew to 15 provinces during the Ming and 18 in the Qing, and later you know, evolved into what we have today. The Mongols brought to China some of the more harsh and draconian laws from their own tradition, as well as from the Kitans and the Jurchens. Some of the more oppressive Yuan Dynasty ways of ruling the people were later adopted by the Ming and Qing Dynasty rulers. If there was one thing the Mongols learned how to do well, it was controlling large numbers of people using few but trustworthy human resources. Their system of controlling the top positions and utilizing the bureaucrats of the conquered lands to administer the place worked great. Yeah, there weren't many of them, but these people from the Mongolian steppe, they sure left a long-lasting legacy. 
Chinese, Islamic, Iranian, Central Asian, and nomadic cultures were all mixed together in the same pot for a while, thanks to the Mongols. It's probably one of those dynamics that yielded so many long-lasting legacies that it's it's hard to point your finger at any one in particular. This Pax Mongolica sure did wonders in providing the stability needed to further the world trade system and the mixing of all these peoples from westernmost lands to the easternmost. Paper money got a big boost during the yuan. The currency was a work in progress and still needed time. And, you know, unfortunately, this dynamic also made it easy for something like the Black Death to happen. But, uh, yeah, I guess you got to take the bad with the good. So there's your... Oversimplified CHP overview of the Yuan Dynasty. Like with anything I present at the CHP, if you really want to learn more, at least you're equipped with the understanding of the main idea. The rest is up to you. Okay, let's just get to a few announcements and I will leave you in peace. Alec Ash, yes, the Alec Ash of the Ant Hill, a writer's colony, has released a new book, Wish Lanterns, Young Lives in New China. This is a deep dive into the lives of six young Chinese. Published by Picador, now available. I'll put the Amazon.uk link on my website. Anything with Alex and Primitor, I highly recommend. There's a new Chinese history podcast. Quality stuff, man. You'll find it on the pop-up Chinese platform. Barbarians at the Gate is the name of the show. The inaugural episode discusses the Anlushan Rebellion and all the rich... History associated with that exciting time in mid-8th century, Tang Dynasty, China. James Palmer and Jeremiah Jenny, two real China history experts, not this Laszlo Montgomery stuff. James Palmer, author of The Bloody White Baron and The Death of Mao, The Tangshan Earthquake and the Birth of New China, and Jeremiah Jenny, of course, an occasional fixture on the Seneca podcast. He's also the longtime proprietor of the venerable Jottings from the Granite Studio blog. I just finished listening to the special second episode. I kid you not. While James was off getting hitched, Jeremiah had Brendan O'Kane together with David Moser discussing David's book out on Penguin Specials called A Billion Voices, China's Search for a Common Language. Holy cow, man, Brendan O'Kane. He did not disappoint. Anyone interested in Mandarin, Putonghua, the Chinese language, Guoyu, or whatever you want to call it. Don't miss this one. On the new hit show, Barbarians at the Gate, the Katans will be up next. Hey, mea culpa. I wrongly said in one of those Zhou Enlai episodes that the world record portrayer of Zhou Enlai in the movies, Wang Tiecheng, portrayed the premiere in the recent movie Zhou Enlai, the Sika Zhou Ye. Listener Warren C., who actually once met Wang Tiecheng, pointed out he was not the one in that movie I mentioned. The story of Zhou Enlai, that was Sun Wei Min. But Wang Tiecheng still has the gold medal as far as number of portrayals. Thanks, Warren. I got that movie mixed up with the 1992 Zhou Enlai movie, which is also quite good. Uh, check out this new website called Sixth Tone, sixthtone.com. Uncommon stories about common people in China. The content is presented by locals in China who ought to know best what's going on. They're backed by the China government, but don't hold that against them. What I saw so far looks quite promising. Go check it out at sixthtone.com. That's all there is. Laszlo Montgomery here, signing off from the City of Angels, Los Angeles, California. Sunny and beautiful as ever. Uh, join me next time if you're so inclined. Let me say the next CHP episode is going to be a good one been requested a hundred times over the years. Can't wait to present this one to you. Take care, everyone. I hope your summer of 2016 is off to a rip-roaring start. More Chinese history coming, free of charge. No hitting you up for favors or donations. Not yet, anyway. See you next time when we meet again for another emocionante episodio de The China History Podcast.